This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 262, recorded on March 24, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. Good to be with you. I've missed you the last couple episodes. I just looked in your background, and I could tell where you were, you know. I'm in Ann Arbor. (laughs) Yeah. Looks like you're in an arbor, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's three places that Michelle can be. <laughs> <laughs> that we know good, of. Good to see you, that we know of. Also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Good to see you. You guys have summer, hot summer weather yet? No, we have rain and 65 degrees Fahrenheit today, which is probably about 20 degrees Celsius. And I'm just back from Philly, where it was lovely. I was at the American Dental Education Association conference where there were 3,000 <laughs> attendees. Wow, wow. face to face, huh? I mean, people are dying to see their colleagues and friends. <laughs> Not from... the greatest choice of words, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> that is probably true. That's probably true. I mean, but Philly is not New York. So, yeah, but Michael, it's six degrees Celsius here. It's pretty cold. Yeah. I... It's gone below freezing this weekend. Yeah. But back in person meetings, I'm hoping that everyone comes to Microbe in in June in DC. So hopefully we'll be able to see everyone again. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. what's the date? It's June 9th, I believe, is when the opening session begins, and then the hardcore science starts on the 10th, and it runs through the 13th. We'll see if I can make it. An unsolicited ad for <laughs> ASM. Ray owes me some nickels. Also joining us today, we are happy to announce a new member of the TWIM team from Washington University in St. Louis, Petra Levin. Hello, Petra. Hello, Welcome. it's great to be here or be back. I'm not sure how to. <laughs> yeah, back. Both. You were here on episode 253, and that was back in October. So uh, welcome to the team, and uh, I look forward to many episodes together talking about microbes. Yes, well, I love to talk about microbes, so it's a good call. <laughs> yeah. Can you give us just a little intro to what, um, how you spend your day? How do I spend my day? Um, <laughs> from start to bottom or uh, at my, once I get to work? Um, there's some dog walking involved um, and uh, some ensuring my 13-year-old gets to school. The 17-year-old gets there herself. Um, but once I get to work, um, I spend as much time as possible trying to talk to people in my lab in between trying to get administrative and writing done. Uh, in the spring, I don't teach. I teach in the fall. And your lab studies. Oh, well, yeah. What do we study? We study <laughs> microbes. Um, we study how the environment impacts the growth, size, cell cycle progression, and antibiotic sensitivity of bacteria generally. We work on Bacillus subtilis, a monoderm. We work on E. coli, a diderm. I'm going to make it happen. Um, And uh, we also recently started some really fun work on Klebsiella, also a diderm and a pretty close relative of E. coli, but it behaves very differently from E. coli, which is exciting for a lot of our assays. Um, And looking at uh, antibiotic resistance, it has some really unusual shapes and behaviors that E. coli doesn't have, which was unexpected. Do you like the monoderm, diderm? I do, because gram positive, gram negative is always, it's hard to explain to students. And it just involves the thickness of the cell wall and how well they adhere to the dye, which I don't think is particularly Mm. useful. And the other reason is my colleagues who work on mycobacteria always you know they don't stain with gram stain and yet they are in the gram positive ish category they're certainly more closely related to gram mm. you know the firmicutes and so i think the monoderm diderm although then the mycobacterial people might say that they also have something resembling kind of an outer membrane ish thing so it's not perfect either 
The great taxonomy. <laughs> exactly. Oh. And and the derm there refers to skin or outer layer. Is it, that where so the, the term comes it's from? The inner membrane uh, is a, and the outer membrane. So on a you know on a right. proteobacteria, right? It would be the two membranes would make you a diderm. But yeah, I'm just wondering where the derm. Yeah, the, the root skin derm. is the skin. The yep. Okay. Membrane. Mm. Got That's it. my understanding from listening to the last twin, which was delightful. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you're part of the delight. So welcome. And just to initiate you, we have you uh, doing our snippet today. <laughs> yes, I picked this. So I guess I'll just launch into this. So I'm always amazed, not only by the variety of bacteria, but how bacteria, some bacteria, not all bacteria, but some bacteria are able to grow in a wide range of carbon sources and environments. So bacteria like E. coli, which lives in your gut, you know, obviously everything in your gut doesn't always stay in your gut. And so E. coli sometimes finds itself in dilute situations or with different carbon sources, depending on what you've eaten or what other bacteria near it have eaten. And E. coli, like other bacteria, has a really amazing ability to pick the best carbon sources. If they're handed a platter with different sugars on it, they always know which one they're going to be able to grow fastest on and which is going to be best for them. And they always eat that one first, kind of like you might eat dessert first, and then they'll find the next best one and the next best one and the next best one. And there is all this beautiful regulation to ensure that they grow on the best sugar first, and then they switch to the next one, et cetera. And so for E. coli, they prefer glucose, and then there's a hierarchy of other sugars. And this paper is looking at a set of regulators that help ensure that E. coli uses glucose if glucose is available before regulating the less preferential before switching on the genes that allows them to use the less preferential sugars. So this paper is by Jordan, Aoyama, Meta Arena, Eashu Zhang, and Gisela Stores. It's called Dual Function Spot 42 RNA encodes a 15 amino acid protein that regulates the CRP transcription factor. So that's a lot of words, but I'm just going to walk kind of through this fairly quickly since it's a snippet. What happens when cells grow in a medium with more than one carbon source or bacteria grow in a medium with one carbon source, they have this elaborate regulatory system I just mentioned that allows them to start with the best one and then work their way down. And this leads to a really cool growth profile. So bacteria grow, you know, they double in mass per unit time. That's called exponential growth. And the rate at which they grow is dependent on the quality of their nutrients. And so when they grow in glucose, they grow really fast. And then when they run out of glucose, they kind of pause and stop growing for a tiny bit. And this allows them to turn on the genes that will allow them to use the next best carbon source. And then they'll grow pretty fast on that one, but not as fast as they would on glucose. And then they'll pause when that runs out, and then they'll switch to the next one, et cetera. And so the name, fancy name for this sort of bumpy growth where you grow really fast until you run out, and then you switch, turn on the genes to digest the next thing and then grow and then switch. It's sort of a bumpy growth curve. It's called dioxic growth or dioxic shift. And bacteria that are able to grow on these many different sugars, they have a special system, which is called somewhat confusingly in the diderm proteobacteria, catabolite repression. But it basically is a system that allows them to only turn on the genes for digesting these alternate sugars when they need them. So bacteria don't like to have things on, uh, make proteins they don't need. So they basically do it on an as-needed basis. And so in this paper by Oyama and colleagues from the Stores Lab, they look at this small RNA called SPOT42, and they actually find that inside this tiny RNA, it's only 100 nucle- 109 nucleotides long, there's a little tiny protein encoded in there, which is only 15 amino acids. So most proteins are like 350 amino acids, is sort of average. So this is tiny. And actually, the storage lab 
are experts at identifying not only these small RNAs and figuring out what they do, but also has more recently gotten into looking at these tiny proteins. And when people first annotated genomes and said, here's a protein, it encodes a protein, here's a gene that encodes a protein or an RNA, they kind of ignored these tiny things. So you need sort of to be looking for them to find them. And the RNAs, this spot, sorry, spot 42 RNA, it basically, if a gene is turned on to digest an alternate sugar, but there's glucose around, the mRNA that's expressed is bound by spot 42. And so you get RNA single stranded, and you get these two RNAs binding together, and that prevents translation of this RNA that would make a protein to digest this lesser sugar. So it turns out, and there's a lot of nice work before this, that spot 42, if you overexpress it, it basically inhibits the activity or translation of genes involved in digesting these lesser carbon sources. So if you make a lot, force the cells to make a lot of spot 42, they don't grow well on these alternative carbon sources. So when they looked at this, again, they find a tiny protein. There's a nice picture in figure one of this teeny tiny 15 amino acid protein that they call inside spot 42. So spot 42 is an RNA and it encodes a teeny tiny protein that's called SPFP. And they can engineer the cells so they make a lot of SPFP, but don't make spot 42. And they can show that they prevent growth on galactose, which is sort of a less, which is a lesser sugar. It's not as good as glucose. So the cells don't want to use it if there's glucose around, but they need to turn on genes to digest galactose if that's the only sugar around. So if they overexpress this little protein, SPFP, even without the spot tRNA, it makes it hard for the cells to grow only as galactose is their only carbon source. And they did some really nice work to show that SPFP actually binds to this CRP creep protein. And CRP's job is to actually help RNA polymerase make or express these genes for growing on these alternative carbon sources. So the idea is this little tiny 15 amino acid protein can bind to CRP and kind of interfere with its ability to transcribe and then have the cells make the proteins for digesting these lesser sugars, one of which is galactose. If I could just interrupt, that was one of the most beautiful experiments where they just looked for suppressor mutants, right? Yeah. And they were able to map then um, the binding site of the protein onto CRP. I just thought that was so gorgeous. Right. So they show, yeah, so it interacts with CRP and then they can find mutations in CRP that prevent it from interacting with this little tiny 15 amino acid protein. And then it's almost, it's essentially insensitive to it, which I... And just by an elegant experiment, just putting the the cells on, forcing them to grow on galactose and then look at the rare ones that do. And then lo and behold, they're mapping onto the structure of the CRP where this thing binds. No, it's amazing. And this is what really defines fitness. Because if you think about it, a 15 amino acid protein is really driving home the fitness concept. Why make something as big as a house to (laughs) inhibit something? If you can get away with 15 amino acids and a little bit of RNA... Go for right, it. so that brings up this question, though: If you have the spot forty-two RNA, why make this protein on top of it? Right, mm-hmm. and that's a big question because mm-hmm. you know we all there always, no matter what, when you study regulation bacteria, there seem to be other levels, layers, but it's hard to kind of pick it out. And this is where they actually get kind of, I think, lucky in that they so RNA because it's got these binding between these nucleotides. If you increased temperature, that interaction between the one strand on the mRNA and the strand on in the spot 42, the higher the temperature, the weaker those interactions are. So they find that SPFP, this little protein, they think is really important at higher temperatures and to allow for this them the cells to grow on glucose at high temperatures not just at sort of 37 body temper you know human body temperature or in the environmental temperature and also we have to appreciate that messenger RNAs do degrade 
and RNA is inherently unstable in bacteria, given the average half-life of a message is approximately 30 seconds. So consequently, adding a protein to stabilize the message may be just the trick that the cell will need in order to get things off or on as fitness will drive the selection. Right, exactly. So I don't know how much, how stable spot 42 is, but um, they definitely, there are chaper- a chaperone actually that HFQ that helps these little RNAs because spot 42 is just one of many small RNAs that regulate mm-hmm. many different processes. But these chaperones, I think, help ensure that they find their targets and interact with them properly. So it's a really beautiful system, but I really think it's almost kind of, it highlights kind of how finely tuned bacteria are and how hard they work to make sure that they're taking maximum advantage of their environment across a wide range of conditions, not only sugars, but temperatures. And there might be other situations where this is important. So I I thought it was beautiful. I I did too. And not only are the microbes really impressive, but the microbiologists also, because (laughs) carbon catabolite repression has been in textbooks like for decades. And here we are in 2022 discovering new components of this mechanism that makes it even more sophisticated and versatile than we'd appreciated. So, yeah. It's a uh, tense test testament to, uh, Focus. You work on the same bacterium for forty years. You're going to find new things, right? Yeah, as and opposed and, to ju- to jumping around <laughs> and working on all kinds of things, right? And as Petra said, um, in the past, it was maybe more difficult to study such tiny proteins, and they were just ignored as just like yeah. noise, evolutionary noise. But um, lo and behold, here's one that affects. Yeah, I remember running gels. Yeah, all the little stuff at the bottom, eh, it's garbage. Right. Just cut it off when you expose it. Same with uh, nucleic acids. We missed the small RNAs for years. Oh, right? absolutely. Right. Yep. So, Petra, if you take stationary E. coli and then you give them a mixture of a, a bunch of sugars, what do they do to know glucose is there? Are there sensors upstream of this? So in terms of regular catabolite repression, the system that transports glucose in – in a series of steps actually leads mm-hmm. to active it leads to prevent crp from transcribing the genes okay. for catabolite repression so if there's glucose out there it binds to the transporter and there's a phosphate that's transferred onto glucose cuz you need to do that anyways to get into glycolysis and so in that process of transferring that phosphate it leads to essentially a situation where CRP doesn't get activated. And so really the cells know what's out there because of essentially what these things on the surface of them are seeing and binding to, I think is how I think about it. Biology loves cyclic nucleotides. Yes. So there is a cyclic nucleotide, (laughs) um, (laughs) cyclic AMP that's involved in this process. And cyclic AMP is basically made... Um, in response to low glucose. Sorry, I get confused because bacillus is a different, the gram positives monoderms are different and sort of have a very different system. And since I've worked in both, but anyways, the, here's a, like sort of one of the original cyclic nucleotide regulations regulates this system to ensure that cells only turn on CRP activated genes when there isn't glucose around. Is, so is this, this uh, preferential use of sugar Beyond E. coli, Subtilis, it does the same thing. Subtilis does, but some bacteria, for example, Acinetobacter baumannii, doesn't like it. Won't grow on glucose at all, and it's unclear Mm -hmm. why. Because glucose is sort of the ideal thing to grow on. It's at the top of glycolysis, so it comes into glycolysis, and that's sort of the main pathway for generating reducing equivalents under aerobic or Mm -hmm. even sometimes anaerobic conditions, and it's the it's the pathway where you get in a glucose and you can put it into the pentose phosphate pathway and you can make it into nucleotides. So it's sort of the ideal molecule. So acinetobacter is kind of odd. And in our hands, at least when we played around with it, it grows actually really well on sugars like uh, acetate and succinate that E. coli grows really poorly on. Acinetobacter loves them. And so it's a senior bacter can be a pathogen. It can also be in the environment. So it's always, it's confused me. Like I, I never really thought it through like why all bacteria wouldn't want, especially environmental organisms wouldn't want glucose at the top because again, it just goes mm. right into this pathway and you can make anything you want. But 
the sort of classic models, E. coli on the gram-negative didorm side and bacillus on the gram-positive monoderm side have always, you know, those are the models. They use glucose. They use NADH at the top of the electron transport chain. And so that's how you're taught it. But it, I, you know, we just talked about this giant bacteria. You guys talked about this giant bacteria last week that does things very differently. And mm. so we sort of get into this glucose-centric view um, mm. but I don't know how widespread this is. I haven't played around with enough organisms. But I, pl- I believe in their paper, they do say that this um, small regulatory RNA and the even smaller protein are encoded by other microbes. So this may be a right mm. more widespread than just E. coli. Right. No, I wouldn't be surprised if it's more widespread. And I mean, I think the process of catabolite repression in general is more widespread. It doesn't have to be glucose. Right. It's just we learn it as glucose. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Petra. So Michelle now will take us through a paper. Yeah. Speaking of small molecules. Um, <laughs> so the title is A Comprehensive Phenotypic Screening Strategy to Identify Modulators of Cargo Translocation by the Bacterial Type 4B Secretion System. It was published in MBio in March um, of this year. And the authors are Eric Cheng, George DeSorin, Stephanie Lehman, Charles Larson, Stephen Titus, Hong Mao Song, Alexei Zargoff, uh, Ganesh Rai, Robert Heinsen, Anton S- um, Simonov, and Matthias Machner. And they are at the NIH um, in three different institutes, the National Institutes of Child Health and Health Development, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, in particular out at the Rocky Mountain Lab. So this is a collaboration um, among our federal scientists at the National Institutes of Health. So basically the punchline here is they are going to do a small molecule screen to identify potential antibiotics, antimicrobials that can block the type 4 secretion system. So what is a type 4 secretion system? It is, um, has evolved from the machinery that bacteria use to transfer DNA, plasmid DNA, from one cell to another. But necessity is the mother of invention. And so over the course of evolution, these type 4 secretion systems have been have evolved into machines that can also equip a number of bacteria to deliver not just DNA, but also proteins um, into host cells. And in particular, the model system that they're going to use is uh, Legionella nemophila. So this is a waterborne bug that normally grows kind of in, in biofilms in the, in the environment, and amoeba come along and eat it. And so over the course of evolution, Legionella has had to figure out a way to not be chewed up by amoeba. And that's where this type 4 secretion system evolved to actually deliver virulence factors, dozens of them, into the amoeba and stall, uh, block its um, rapid digestion by the amoeba. And this same system also equips Legionella to grow in the white blood cells that keep our, the, the lungs, um, our lungs uh, clear of harmful microbes. So the same type 4 secretion system is known to block Legionella's um, uh, delivery to lysosomes in um, these macrophages as well as amoeba. So it would be a great system to um, identify new antimicrobials that can block Legionella growth, but it's actually much more important than that. Um, why, Why go after this? Why use Legionella? Um, well, first of all, um, these type 4 secretion systems are important not only for Legionella to cause pneumonia, but also for pertussis that's caused by um, Bordetella pertussis or whooping cough. Also, ulcers caused by Helicobacter pylori, Q fever caused by Coxiella, which we'll talk about in a bit, and even um, crown gall tumors on plants. Agrobacterium tumefaciens uses a type 4 secretion system to grow on plants. So there are a number of microbes that rely on these type 4 secretion systems. Um, so that makes this a, an attractive target for a new class of drugs. Not only that, but as, as um, those of you who are, are um, concerned as we are about antimicrobial resistance, we know that um, when you treat a population with an antimicrobial, you're putting selective pressure on for mutants that can sidestep the um, antibiotic. 
And what is um, really um, key about this is these type 4 secretion systems are absolutely required for Legionella and other bacteria to set up a protected home to replicate. But once they're replicating, they don't need the type 4 secretion system anymore. Or if Legionella is growing out in the in the water, as like in a biofilm, um, it doesn't need, or in, in micro, uh, microbiological media, it doesn't need this type 4 secretion system. So the thought is that there would be less selective pressure for um, the bacteria to um, generate resistance to this class of microbes. Not only that, but we now appreciate that um, Taking antibiotics not only puts us at risk of developing specific resistance, but it also can wipe out the beneficial microbes that live in us and on us. So, for example, if a person is taking antibiotics, they become more at higher risk of getting um, a colitis caused by um, Clostridium difficile. And all told, antibiotic resistance causes millions of of um, infections and deaths in the United States a y- each year. So, for example, the CDC is, is estimating 2.8 million antibiotic-resistant infections occur in the U.S. each year. And if we add um, antibiotic-associated infections, such as colitis caused by C. difficile, that is another 3 million infections. So, clearly, we need new antibiotics, and ideally, they would not disturb our um, normal, healthy microbiota, but rather target something quite specific like a type 4 secretion system that Legionella and other microbes require. Another advantage of targeting type 4 secretion systems is we have, um, they've been known now for probably 20 years, and we have a lot of really beautiful genetic data, and also now structural biologists have gotten um, into, the, into the act and have generated just really beautiful, exquisite, three-dimensional um, uh, images of what these structures look like. So that will really facilitate um, understanding how these particular drugs might work and also using them as tools to study type 4 secretion in the lab. So for many reasons, um, understanding how these type 4 secretion systems work and identifying small molecules that can inhibit them could really help us both in healthcare but also science. So that's why they were looking for this. Now, how did they do it? They came up with some really um, clever, high-throughput screens that was based on prior work. A number of people in the field have identified um, proteins that Legionella uh, delivers into host cells by a type 4 secretion system. And one of them um, is called LID-A. This was characterized by um, Isberg's group back in 2005. And Isberg's group also showed that if they um, fuse lid A to beta lactamase, which is an, an enzyme, um, and make that fusion protein, it will be translocated by Legionella into host cells. And they know that because they could then demonstrate that the beta lactamase reporter could cleave beta lactam rings. Now, the way you can measure that is there are small fluorescent molecules, fluorophores. Um, And there's one in particular that has a blue fluorescent moiety and a green fluorescent moiety, and they are linked together by a beta-lactam ring. So what they can do is take um, their host cells, in this case, um, a macrophage cell line. They can load them up with the fluorescent. Well, first, they can treat them with um, these small molecule inhibitors and then infect with Legionella and now um, ask whether or not Legionella is translocating this beta-lactamase through type 4 secretion by adding this um, uh, fluorophore that's blue linked by a beta-lactam ring to a green fluorophore. So if beta-lactamase has gone through the type 4 secretion system and clipped that beta-lactam ring, then it would dissociate these two fluorophores. So when they're dissociated due to beta-lactamase activity, then the cells will fluoresce as blue. But if there's an inhibitor that keeps the two fluorophores together, what happens is you excite the blue one and then it transfers its energy to the, the tightly linked green moiety and it now fluoresces green. So what that means is they can set up plate assay with tiny little wells where you only need six microliters of fluid in each well, and they can put it on a microplate reader and quickly get quantitative data on how much beta-lactamase was delivered into the host cells through this type 4 secretion system. 
So this then sets up a really efficient um, high throughput assay where they can now screen thousands of compounds and ask, is there any in this large collection that um, inhibits the cleavage of this fluorophore due to type 4 secretion system? So uh, the, they spent um, quite a bit of time thinking about the ideal setup for this large screen, but then they also had to spend a, a lot of time optimizing the conditions. And part of the reason is, again, they're setting out, they're going to screen some 18,000, I believe, You do compounds. indeed have that right, <laughs> Michelle. It's 18,000. And as the PI in the lab said, he has signs all over the lab warning everyone that the library that they are using costs more than a new BMW. Oof. So be careful when you screw up your experiment. And Dr. Cheng wrote in a note back to us when we told him we were going to talk about this on TWIM, and I think it's important to interject it here, is they snuck, someone snuck into the microplate reader and flicked a switch on a filter, and they put their plate in, and they thought all the results were trashed because the person who snuck in ahead of them, not signing up, didn't reset the machine. And, you know, poor... Poor Eric is going to go back to George and say, oh, God, that experiment we just did with the 18,000 compounds didn't work. And yet it costs the price of a BMW. But Michelle is going to tell us how it turned out. <laughs> they um, collected themselves after having that panic thought, like, what did we forget? Um, it was the old, like, did you turn it on? So they just looked at the settings, realized once they set the settings on this fluorescence reader, um, then they started to get beautiful data. Their positive control worked, their negative control worked, and lo and behold, they were able to screen through 18,000 compounds. And these come from three different federal libraries and then seven commercial libraries. So this um, whole enterprise to screen small molecule libraries to find new drugs is now um, more accessible to a wide range of people because you can you can purchase these libraries. And that's where the um, National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences came through. They had these libraries. So after going through this really impressive screen, they were able to identify in their primary screen um, some 500 compounds that in fact um, had less of the blue fluorescence and more of the green fluorescence indicating the beta-lactamase activity had gotten into the macrophages and cleaved their fluorophore. And because of the, um, they did this on such a small scale, they were using um, plates. Um, and so those of you who are listening that have done research, you might have used a six well plate or a 24 well plate or maybe a 96 well plate. Well, they were able to scale this down to a plate that had 1,536 wells in each plate. <laughs> and each well only had a six microliter volume. So this is great because as Michael just pointed out, these inhibitor libraries are quite expensive. And so the, the smaller the um, scale that you're working on, the more um, economical and efficient uh, the whole operation is. So fortunately, they were able to not only screen 18,000, but over a concentration range. So they were able to use five or six different concentrations of each of the candidates. And then automatically, um, the machinery would ge generate um, curves and allow them to identify strong inhibitors, weaker inhibitors, et cetera, and understand the dose response. And that data is shown in um, figure one. So they then wanted to take the, the um, first set of of um, hits, 500 of them, and test at a wider range of, com of concentrations in a, in a slightly larger scale. So they just wanted to confirm. And um, fortunately, they had still 113 that survived that second screen and were still active. So now they're set up to learn more about these. They're convinced that these 113 are interfering with the beta-lactamase-based um, uh, assay for type 4 secretion. But they want to learn whether they're actually affecting type 4 secretion and not something trivial, like what if they're just inhibiting beta-lactamase? So that was one of their first kind of verification screens they did. And some 
compounds uh, dropped out of their screen. They were now down to 97. Then they said, it's not going to be a useful drug if it's simply killing the mammalian cell, and that's why we're not seeing this beta-lactamase activity. So they just did another simple high-throughput assay, and sure enough, um, some of them were um, toxic at the compound concentrations they were using. So that got them down to now 62 candidates. And then they wanted to ask whether um, they're actually affecting growth of Legionella in the mammalian cell. So let's use an assay that's more specific than just the beta-lactamase delivery into the cell, but rather bacterial growth, growth of Legionella in macrophages. So for that, they set up another um, clever um, fluorescence microscopy-based assay that would allow them to do this um, quantitative assays in a high-throughput manner to screen their remaining um, 97 um, candidates. And that data is shown in um, figure three. And what you can see is that if the bacteria were replicating, they were um, naturally, or they had been engineered to express green fluorescent protein. So the more the bacteria replicated, the more green fluorescence you would have in each well. And they counterstained also the nuclei with um, a blue stain so they could get a total count for macrophages with blue, the blue fluorescence and then what's the bacterial load using green fluorescence. So again, very simple but quantitative assay allowed them again to generate dose response curves and um, look at the ability of um, their compounds to inhibit Legionella replication. And that um, the dose response there for seven of their uh, most enticing candidates is shown in um, figure 3D. As Michelle collects her thoughts, that's not your father's viable count. <laughs> that, that, that is really the viable count of the 2020s using these very sophisticated techniques and the amount of information that they're able to reduce. Remember, they started at 18,000. Just imagine doing 18,000 viable counts. Yeah, at, now at six down, different concentrations. At six different concentrations. It, it, it will make even the strongest graduate student <laughs> weep. And th think about what's actually going on in this paper. It's open access, so you can actually look at the phenomenal progress that they are making at screening these libraries. It's, it's just incredible. And this is where new drugs are coming from, folks. So I have a question, actually, how... Are they using yeah. a robot for this or did they use graduate student labor? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would imagine that they have um, multi-channel automated pipetters that can drop. Yeah, I think they um, must be microbes. The plates are. Yep. I've only. I've never seen these plates. I've seen the three eighty fours, and those are already really tiny. Yeah, yeah. You need good eyes to do the three eighty fours. Let me take a quick look at the um, materials and methods, but I think this is all fluorescence based and automated assays. Yeah, it look, it, that's what it looks like to me, that they're all, um, it's all automated. Okay, yeah. Then they probably also have something that stacks them like a robot to load the plate reader over and over in a circle. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah that I'm not sure. But um, yeah, it's amazing. Of course, it's, it's also not fair that they put all of this work into one paper, because as we read it, it's like, oh, then they did this. And then the next day, they did <laughs> it is not fair. It is not fair. It's yeah. not fair. It's not, it's not real life. All right. So they have now um, a number that can affect, uh, that clearly are inhibiting Legionella replication. And the next question is, um, what about uh, do they also affect replication when the bacteria are just growing in a rich media? So they um, did that assay next, and um, one of them looked like it was affecting, a couple of them were affecting uh, Legionella replication um, in broth as well, um, and that's shown in figure four. And so they now wanted to ask um, even a more specific question about whether these inhibitors are likely to be affecting type 4 secretion itself. And for that, they used a more specific virulence assay than growth. And that was based on um, observations from um, Isberg and Schumann's lab decades ago that the type 4 secretion equips Legionella to avoid being delivered to um, the endosomal degradative lysosomes. Um, and so, again, they used a fluorescence microscopy assay to look at where the bacteria bacteria um, were located inside the macrophage, what compartment were they in, in the absence of the drug and in the presence of different concentrations of these um, candidate uh, drugs. 
And so, again, the fluorescence assay um, is shown, again, quantitative assay um, that's shown in figure five. And we can see, for example, that in the presence of compound C4, um, Legionella is ending up in a lysosome, um, late endosomal lysosomal compartment because it's got LAMP1, the macrophage protein LAMP1, um, surrounding the Legionella um, bacteria, whereas in the absence of the compound, the bacteria are not surrounded by LAMP1, so they're in a permissive replication compartment. So that um, was the end of their characterization. They started out with 18,000 um, compounds, and they've ended up with a, a selection of, of six or seven that they think are worth um, studying. And they um, provide the schematic uh, structure of each of these seven compounds in their um, table S2. So those chemists who are li listening um, could take a look. And then the authors are careful to say that these are um, really um, attractive candidates to study further, but they um, uh, allow that they don't yet know how specific um, any of these compounds are. They'll need to do further work to uh, learn whether they're physically inter interacting, for example, with this um, translocation needle and interrupting its activity, or perhaps they're acting more upstream in a way that um, we can't predict. So, but it's a great set of compounds that they can now use to better understand Legionella growth and how type 4 secretion system is contributing and if one of these compounds is specifically interfering with the assembly or the um, activity of the type 4 secretion system. I should also add that they also wanted to ask whether these compounds were specific just for the Legionella that use type 4 secretion system, or might they also affect others that do? And that's why they collaborated with um, uh, Bob Heinsohn's group out at the Rocky Mountain Lab, who studies Coxiella burnetti. So this is an obligate intracellular bacterium that is um, somewhat related to Legionella, but it has a type 4 secretion system that is um, fairly similar to the Legionella one. And so they uh, did a series of experiments there and demonstrated that indeed these compounds also affect um, type 4 secretion system uh, dependent growth of Coxiella in mammalian cells, but some do not affect its replication in nutrient broth. So there is um, hope here that these some of these small molecules that they've identified in this massive, highly specific screen are going to give us tools to um, study type 4 secretion system and potentially um, treat infections caused by pathogens that rely on these systems. So let me interject a little bit about the first author, Eric Chang. Uh, Michelle always asks the authors of the full paper that we do for a piece of advice. And uh, Dr. Chang was a little bit reluctant to offer this, he says, but he nevertheless did for his fellow scientists in particular, those that are still in grad school or starting their postdoc, his piece of advice is network as much as you can. Spend that extra five minutes at the cookie table <laughs> after seminar to say hi to your fellow graduates, to school peers and mentors instead of running back to the lab. Mm -hmm. At a conference, get out of your comfort zone. Pick a random table during a freshman break or introduce yourself to those small interactions will actually open doors for you in your life and your career. And Dr. Cheng is currently a technology transfer manager at the National Cancer Institute of Technology Transfer Center, where he supports over 20 key investigators in the pediatric oncology branch. And so he actually takes the science that we all develop on our bench and actually uh, operationalizes it, gets it out into clinics, gets it out into society, and hopefully the taxpayers will appreciate that the investment in funding to fund our science is actually worth uh, the money that the Congress is investing in us. And uh, he's had a rather interesting career. He started as an undergrad at UC Berkeley 
then went to Rosalind Franklin University in Chicago, where he got a master's of science in medical imaging that I think you can see has paid handsome dividends in the science he offered here. And then he came over to our side and began to investigate bacterial pathogenesis, specifically the gene regulation of chlamydia trachomatis, another obligate intracellular parasite. And this paper actually is a collaboration. So that networking piece of advice that he gave us is actually a collaboration between uh, his postdoc lab in Matthias Mochner's lab, as well as the lab that he conducted the science in with, with George Dorserin, and the, the lab out at Rocky Mountain. So again, folks, it's team science all the way. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's one of the buzzwords NIH is looking for these days is team-based science. And I think this paper really illustrates the value proposition that working in an integrated, highly efficient team can accomplish. They took 18,000 and got it down to seven candidates. Pretty impressive. I also loved how transparent they were about everything they did so that other people can model their um, oh, yeah. their own small molecule screens after them and the logic and then some of the technical aspects as well. Michelle, do any of these go into animals or do they need more chemical modifications before that? I don't know the answer to that. So my understanding with these in general is they need to figure out a little bit more before they go into animals because sometimes Mm -hmm. you get what you look for, like a genetic screen, but often the target is not what, there's often some complication about how they work in terms of target. Mm -hmm. And there may be off-target effects. effects. Mm -hmm. That's happened with a lot of the inhibitors for cell division machinery. They'll find things that inhibit them in vitro or even in the cells. And then when they actually look deeper, it's not inhibiting in the way they predict. So I think my guess is there's one more. And that explains why they did a number of the um, verification validation uh, steps to screen out the ones that were just um, intoxicating the host cell or mm-hmm. preventing growth in uh, of the bacteria in regular media. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. But um, yeah. and then my other question I have about this, I have this with every small molecule screen, maybe just. But what is the potential? And again, I don't. This is maybe more historical since they're not at that step yet. For these, the bacteria to pick up mutations that bypass these, because that's always the problem when you find target when you find an antibiotic right, or a small molecule that functions like a, you know, traditional antibiotic, how easy is it for the cells to pick up a mutation that allows them to grow in the host? I I think unlike, um, say, some of our drugs that target components of the ribosome or, you know, affect really um, what we call um, housekeeping functions of a cell, the type 4 secretion system is needed for transmission from one cell to another, but not for replication per se. So that's why they're hopeful that um, it will be more rare, there'll be less selective mm-hmm. pressure on um, the bacteria that are exposed to these. And then also, I, I failed to mention that to our knowledge, none of the beneficial microbes that live on us and in us rely on type 4 secretion systems. So we're less likely to um, generate antibiotic resistance in or, or wipe out our, our beneficial microbes if we're taking a type 4 secretion-specific um, antibiotic. Right. That's really important. Yeah. So my other question I had when reading this, and this is, is would this be effective? So Bordetella pertussis uses the, their type 4 to secrete the toxin that essentially causes whooping cough. So would this right. kind of thing be effective? Like you could get a Bordetella infection but prevent the like symptoms of it. Or does Bordetella not have these parts? Yeah, so more, those are good questions. More work will need to be done. I don't know whether Bordetella needs its type 4 secretion system to colonize. I sort of doubt it because I don't know whether the other Bordetellas that colonize us that don't cause whooping cough have type 4 secretion systems. Do you know, Michael? Not off the top of my head. I'm yeah. wondering if Bronchoseptica does or not. Yeah. Robin Patel is my Bordetella go-to person. (laughs) Uh, Thank you, Michelle. My pleasure. I want to read one email because I said a few uh, episodes ago, hey, how about some email? So we got some. And this is from Scott, who is in Madison, Wisconsin. He writes, 
My eight-year-old frequently asks about ingredients he reads on labels. Mm. After a visit to the dentist, he received a tube of toothpaste with stannous fluoride as the active ingredient. He asked what stannous fluoride was, what it did, and if it was better than sodium fluoride. While I could answer that stannous fluoride is an ionic compound of fluorine and tin instead of the fluorine and sodium that was in his other toothpastes, I couldn't tell him much more. After Googling stannous fluoride, I found references from the ADA and toothpaste websites saying that stannous fluoride is more antimicrobial than the more typically used sodium fluoride. This conversation reminded me of the discussion Twim had a few months ago about triclosan being removed from toothpaste. So I hope you might answer some questions we couldn't find answers to, especially because oral microbiology is in Michael's wheelhouse. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Well, um, wait a minute. Let me ask the questions, Michael. Hang on. (laughs) All right. Does stannous fluoride have greater antimicrobial properties than other fluoride formulations? Does it have any benefits that make it better? If it's any different, what is it about the tin ion that makes stannous fluoride more effective? Okay. I don't. The answer to the question is yes. And (laughs) as a young graduate student at Indiana University, I learned the wonder of how the chemistry department always had better cookies at its seminars. Mm -hmm. And it was because they were receiving royalties for the patent that the chemistry department acquired from and actually then licensed to Procter & Gamble for an exclusive contract to use stannous fluoride in its Crest toothpaste that was first introduced to the market in 1955. And this was principally the work of Harry Day, Josephy e. Mueller and William Nebergal, and they created the first fluoride toothpaste. And Mueller was a dental student in 1945, and he tested the wide variety of fluoride compounds, very similar to what we saw in today's paper. Hmm. And he learned that stannous fluoride was the most effective at remineralizing tooths, and it's really the interaction of how the fluoride replaces the hydroxyl ion in the calcium hydroxyapatite that changes the dissolution kinetics. You always have saturating concentrations of calcium and phosphate in your saliva, and your tooth is constantly undergoing remineralization. And it's the acid that allows the Uh, destabilization of the enamel. And by swapping out the fluorine for the hydroxyl ion, you actually create a more acid-resistant enamel. So every time your young son eats a gummy bear, he makes a whole bunch of lactic acid that drops the pH. And as that pH goes down, you, of course, can lose enamel. But if you've been using fluoride toothpaste and drinking fluoridated water, and you don't have to drink a lot of it, you just need to change that dynamic equilibrium enough so that gummy bear doesn't begin to create what the dentists call a white spot. And that's the initial phase of dental caries. And that's what the dentist is always looking for when he's checking out your teeth. And, um, Cari- cariology is a complicated mixture, and um, it's also why the great orange juice companies put calcium in orange juice because the the form of calcium they, they, they load up the orange juice with is more soluble, so you can actually absorb more of the calcium. So then the calcium is in your saliva to help the remineralization of your teeth. Hmm. I mean, it's it's all connected. All this tech transfer <laughs> stuff really comes into play. Right. So, so Michael, sorry. go ahead. So the stannous fluoride, though, also, my understanding is that Colgate used it to replace the triclosan because it also has antimicrobial properties. It's a membrane disruptor, basically. It's not super fancy. Actually. And so they essentially, they took out the triclosan And they now use stannous fluoride in high concentrations. And there's some proprietary secret that allows it because it can be really gritty, gritty, and uh, 
I think somehow they have figured out how to make it much less gritty. Although there have been did. some complaints mm-hmm. about it not being the same as the triclosan formulation. It, there, there have indeed been complaints about that. And in fact, remember, Procter & Gamble is Crest and Colgate is a completely different right. company. And so the patent, since the patent was issued ah. in the 50s, the patent only lives one generation, 20 years. And so the patent has gone poof. And so that enabled Colgate to use the better fluoride compound in their toothpaste because it's off patent. Mm, cool. And if you go back to TWIM 253, you can hear Petra talk about Treklesand because you published a paper on that, right? Yes. Which I remember. So, Michael, besides gummy bears, what else should I stay away <laughs> from? Um, <laughs> any, the thing that I was drinking today, phosphoric acid. Uh, I don't drink that. It's okay. But any, any sweets, basically? Any sweets. Remember, but, uh, how about pasta? Is pasta okay? It's a carb. So it's going to make lactic acid, right? Yeah. Remember, the life of a bacterium is to regenerate oxidized NAD. But, but, and but, the but, only but. way they can do that <laughs> is, is by making, taking that pyruvic acid, blowing off a mole of CO2, making acetate, mm-hmm. and transferring the electrons then to lactic acid the pyruvate okay. becomes yeah. the lactic acid but isn't okay. it the case that with our fluorinated water and our fine toothpaste most of us do okay eating some sugar we do indeed <laughs> michelle is correct as always <laughs> which takes us okay. back to the glucose and eco yeah there you go but it's a full circle podcast <laughs> but hold on today. because scott's son has a question for us oh yes so, uh, P.S., a joke from my eight-year-old. Why Uh-oh. are bacteria so good at math? Hmm. Because oh. they multiply so fast. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. So there, folks, send in some more questions and jokes from your kids. We'd love to hear them. Uh, that is TWIM262. Show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIM. Send us your questions comments, kid jokes, twim at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. Go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. We are a nonprofit corporation, so your contributions are U.S. federal tax deductible. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, and go blue. (laughs) Got two teams in the Sweet 16, so... Now, what is that, uh, basketball? Yeah, men. Yeah, basketball. both the men and the women are in the Sweet 16. So. All right. We feel so badly for Kentucky. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I don't know what you guys are talking about, but it's okay. <laughs> Michael Schmitz at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. And Petra Levins at Wash U, Washington University in St. Louis. Thanks, Petra. Welcome to TWIM. Thank you. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. <laughs>